Now, this is not exactly how I pictured my first speech from the East Room. <laughs> Two years ago, when I got started on the Odyssey that uh, became probably one of the most extraordinary presidential elections, I never could have imagined in my wildest dreams the way it would have turned out. I think at the time, no one thought that the current leader was even serious about the contest. But we are where we are. When I think about being here at the uh, Nixon Library, I think uh, I don't have any anecdotes I can tell you about Nixon. I was 11 years old. But I do remember at the time, and many of you will, if you're my age or older, will remember the pictures of the helicopters. I'm reminded of that, taking off the embassy in Saigon and the end of the war. I do remember Nixon giving speeches on television. I have to tell you, at 11, they were a little long and a little bit dry. But I remember him sitting there because it would, you know, there were three channels and it would be dominated by the president's speech and they would be written out and done verbatim for the most part. But I got lucky enough when I was in Washington to become associated with a group called the Nixon Policy Center. It actually has another name. It's now called the Center for National Interest. And what they represent is a foreign policy think tank or a, an arena for foreign policy issues that is... Uh, has the understanding, basically, that maybe we shouldn't intervene all the time, everywhere, that maybe we don't always know what's best, that maybe there are unintended consequences to us thinking that we can be all things to all people. So to me, it's a, it's a forum for common sense. You don't hear much of it in Congress, but the Center for National Interest actually has that. I was at a um, one of the speeches not too long ago I got to give to them, and Kissinger was actually on the podium. I remember him from when I was a kid. And um, I remember having difficulty following his speeches when I was 11, and I still have a little bit of difficulty. <laughs> but he's a smart guy. And so I was there, and I was trying to think, what is the thing that I can talk about that I might be uh, related somehow or can relate personally to with, uh, with Nixon? And what I thought about is that when I was a kid, we had a uh, guy that was a friend of our family, and we called him Captain Pete. His name was Pete Karpenko, and he came from the Ukraine, and he actually fought in the Tsar's army. I don't know how old you have to be to fight in the Tsar's army, like against the Bolsheviks in 1917. I knew him in the early 70s, so he was probably in his 80s, and I think he had fought when he was like 12 or 14 years old. This is a guy who had lived and seen the consequences of socialism and communism, seen it up close, seen it firsthand. And in those days, in the early 70s, most of the hardcore conservatives, and that was what our family was at that time, you probably wouldn't have called us libertarian at the time, you would have called us hardcore conservatives, anti-communists, like the hardcore right wing of the party. And we were, I would say my dad and myself following along, we were thinking, well, we shouldn't recognize Red China. We shouldn't trade with Red China. That's like giving gifts to the communists. However, it's one of the things that I changed my opinion on over time, and I think so did my father. The idea that basically when you trade with people, you're less likely to fight with them. And there's a quote that, I, that uh, George W. Bush uh, put forward that I kind of like, and he said that trade sort of uh, begins the habits of freedom but trade also creates the expectations of democracy. And I think that's kind of the way we could describe our relationship with China. Are they free and democratic? Do they have free political expression? No. But is it better than it was under Mao? Is it better that we not be, you know, right at each other waiting for nuclear war with China? So in the end, I think Nixon was right to open trade with Red China. And that trade is a better, is a good thing. Is it always to our advantage? I don't know. We're having that debate in our country right now. We started out with uh, many of the presidential candidates being for trade, and now they've all switched to being against trade. Hillary Clinton negotiated the trade treaty. She was once for it before she was against it. Cruz was for it before he was against it. Trump, I think, was never for it. <laughs> but when we analyze things like trade and we want to ask ourselves, is it a good thing or a bad thing? You have to add up the numbers, and you have to look at it. And part of the problem with trade is, there is what is seen and there is what is unseen. Bastiat was a philosopher and a French parliamentarian back in the 1850s, and he talked about the seen and the unseen. It's very easy to see when government collects all of your money and builds a big 10-story tall building. You can say, look at this brand new building the government built. That is the scene. 
The unseen is the dollar they took from each one of you. It came out of the economy, and it's harder to see the deleterious effects of when the government takes money from you in small increments because you can see the bright, shiny building. Same with trade. With trade, we see, and what's very visible sometimes, are the loss of jobs. In Ashland, Kentucky, we lost 600 jobs this year in a steel industry that's been there since 1903. You can see that, you can feel that, you can meet them, you can meet the people who are out of work. But at the same time, if you add up the numbers, it looks like we're a farming state, we'll gain $2 billion worth of new trade by opening up markets. We also distill bourbon. If you need bourbon, we have plenty for you. <laughs> And they look to new markets in Asia by lowering tariffs. Uh, the average shopper saves about $800 in Walmart every year, but you save it a nickel and a dime and a penny and a dollar at a time. But that $800 for the average consumer at the end of the year is $800 more that you can spend. I haven't looked at the numbers in California, but in all reality, probably trade is good for California. Right on the edge of our country, I'm sure you have an enormous trade across the Pacific. But it's difficult because you see somebody who loses a job in an existing older industry, but you may not see what's being gained by trade on the other side. But I think Nixon uh, was prophetic in, in opening the door to having a more integrated world. And whether you have a positive or negative opinion of the trade agreements, I think there's something to be said for we are less likely to fight with people we trade with. War is a devastating and terrible thing. I love the quote from Eisenhower, who says, I hate war like only a soldier who's experienced. I hate war because of the futility, the stupidity, the banality of war. Eisenhower knew that, and there was a time in which we had many people in our government who had served in the military, and you know who the people most circumspect, the people less likely to take us to war, are people who have actually served and seen it up close. We've lost some of that. And I think as a consequence, we do have sometimes maybe a little bit uh, too much of an eagerness or a lack of reticence with getting into war. I think we saw that a little bit in the presidential debate. I tried to point out that we need to look at the world as it is, not in some sort of Alice in Wonderland, this is the perfect world we want, and you know, if we just topple Gaddafi, maybe they'll elect Thomas Jefferson. It doesn't seem to be working out that way. We need to look at the world as it is and determine whether or not, as physicians would say, first we do no harm. Are we going to make things worse? If you look backwards in time, have we made things better or worse? I think Libya, without question, is worse. Is it more chaotic or less chaotic? It's more chaotic since Gaddafi's gone. Is the region more stable or less stable? No question it's less stable. Are we more threatened by people who would organize and be terrorists to attack us now or under Gaddafi? A third of Libya now pledges allegiance to ISIS. We're back in there bombing targets in Libya, and there's a completely failed state in Libya. But it's not just Libya. The story of Libya is also the story of Syria. One of the most alarming, or I guess one of the most revealing stories I saw recently was a story about a city called Marea, M-A-R-E-A. It's near Azaz, just north of Aleppo in Syria. They are battling for Marea right now. And you know who the two groups are? Kurdish troops supported by the Pentagon and some righteous brothers of jihad supported by the CIA. They are battling for a city in Syria, and we are supporting both sides of a battle. There are people in the Senate, I won't mention any names, but John McCain, <laughs> who, want to, who want to bomb both sides of the war. They want to bomb ISIS, but they also want to bomb Assad at the same time. There are two million Christians in Syria. More Christians in Syria than any other country other than Egypt. Who protects them? Assad. To a person, if, if they were here and we asked them, who would you be for, Assad or anybody on the other side? They would pick Assad. Does that make Assad a great guy? No, he's probably an evil despot. He probably used chemical weapons on his own people. And yet, is he better than the 1,500 Islamic groups on the other side that you know, just would soon would see a Christian's head on a pike as on a body? They fear what happens if Assad is gone. But it goes back even further. We go back to the Iraq war. Are we better off with Hussein gone? 
Was Hussein a good guy? Absolutely not. But the region is still suffering the chaos of removing Hussein. We say, well, why can't we, you know, replace dictators with democracy? It happened here. We, we, got, we got rid of the king and we got a democratic government. Well, you know what? We had an extraordinary experience in our country. Why? Extraordinary because we didn't really throw off all of what was with us. We threw off the king. We threw off the yoke of the king, but we kept a lot of traditions. We kept the tradition of elected government. A lot of people don't realize this, but we had elective government. The House of Burgess started meeting in the 1630s, 1640s. So by the time you get to the American Revolution, we've had over 100 years of elective government. None of it stopped. Even throughout the war, we kept our elective government. We had the common law. Many of the restraints on the king and the government began with the Magna Carta on the plains of Runnymede in 1215. We didn't give up on all of that. We kept all of those English traditions. We kept our religion. Most of us were bound by our religion. You know, when Washington says that democracy requires a virtuous people, part of what allowed us to thrive and, and continue on and not drop into chaos was this religious backbone. But you compare and contrast that with other times in history. Compare and contrast that with the French Revolution. French Revolution, they threw off the king, but the king was their religion. The religion was the state religion, and they had nothing. And they wound up in a very chaotic situation until they finally got another strong man. Look at the Middle East. Is there a strong history of democracy in the Middle East? I'm aware of almost none. And so when, when we say we're going to be and we're going to try to help them find freedom, perhaps what we help them find is a, a, another form of authoritarianism or of various forms of de despotism. So we have to think before we act. When we were on the stage and everybody was like every other Republican candidate and all the Democrat candidates were saying, we need to have a no-fly zone over there. It's like, do you not realize Russia's already there? Russia's already flying, so what you're saying is you're going to shoot down Russian planes. Christie's standing right next to me and he says, damn right, I'll be the first one to shoot down the Russian planes. <laughs> really? I mean, is that the level of seriousness that we're going to treat? Who's going to be in charge of our nuclear weapons? The, the, the businessman from New York, I can't, what's his name? <laughs> he was asked about the nuclear triad, and he had no freaking idea what it was. And it's not complicated, it's that we can deliver air, missiles by air, by land, and by sea. That's a nuclear triad. To make things worse, he had been asked the same question about a month before by Hugh Hewitt. He was asked the exact same question and still had no idea. But to make up for it, his campaign a week later responded in this way. They said, well, yeah, yeah, we have a nuclear try, but our biggest problem is we have been unwilling to use it. <laughs> we have other candidates that say the answer to the Middle East is we're going to make the sand glow. We're going to do carpet bombing of the Middle East. Really? That's somehow going to make things better? Trump said he was, oh, that's right, that's it, Trump. <laughs> He said he's going to kill the families of the terrorists. Really? You're going to line up little kids and shoot them in the head? We are better than that. He says, oh, waterboarding is just the beginning. Yeah, we'll waterboard them. We'll do everything. It's like, that's not who we are. If we give up who we are as a people, have we really given up? Have we really won or have they won? I met one of the policemen after the Boston bombing. And I like the way he put this. He was there. He was running through the streets, the emotion. And he was angry. I'd be angry too. I still am angry at someone who would kill women and children, you know, just indiscriminately to bomb civilians as if that somehow was going to further a religious ideal. But he said when we caught the second brother, they caught the one that was alive, the one hiding under the boat, he said that he was proud to be an American because we didn't beat him to death with tire irons. He's going to get a day in court. He's going to get a trial. Is he guilty as hell? Yes. Does he deserve to be punished? Yes. But we didn't resort to mob violence. One of the things that I've been fighting for five years now is that it is on our books that an American citizen can be indefinitely detained. And you say, oh, we're just going to have, it's just going to be the Muslims. Well, who's next? The Jews. How about the Hispanics? How about the people with brown skin? How about the, the gays? How about anybody that's not popular? We have the protections of the Bill of Rights because they are to protect the least popular among us. 
The Bill of Rights isn't for the high school quarterback. The Bill of Rights is not for the prime queen, although it is. But it's really for those who aren't popular. The Bill of Rights is so you get justice, so you get your day in court. When President Obama signed the law that says that we can detain an American citizen without a trial, he said, yes, but I am a good man and I will not use it. That's not what the law is about. The law is about expecting that you'll get the worst people in office. As John can tell you, you often do get the worst people in office. You want the laws to bind people. The goal of the Constitution was, as Jefferson said, to be the chains that bind government, that restrict and restrain government. That's my concern, is that you have a law in the books that says we can indefinitely detain an American citizen without a trial. We did that to the Japanese. You remember the incarceration of the Japanese, the internment that we did out here. So there have been times we have made mistakes. It's not impossible to imagine that a government can make wholesale mistakes on what you look like, or where you came from, or who your parents are. We went through an episode where we now have bulk collection of all of your phone records. And you say, oh, what's the deal? It's just a bunch of numbers and metadata and how long I'm on the phone. Through metadata, a couple Stanford students put an app on a phone and they found that they can tell 85% of the time what your religion is. They can tell 100% of the time who your doctors are. They can tell the vast majority of the time what your medicines are by metadata. One former head of the NSA said, we kill people based on metadata. My guess is that metadata can tell quite a bit about us and that we need to be very careful about allowing that to happen. I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago and FBI Director Comey was there, James Clapper was there, and they were like acting all upset and it's all Snowden's fault and everybody's encrypting all of their information. That the default position is now encryption. And I was like, guys, guys, this isn't a reaction to Snowden, it's a reaction to you. It's a reaction to you lying to the American public and saying you were not doing this. It's a reaction to the entire world saying they don't even want American products. Do you know that we've lost billions of dollars? Because anybody who can buy somebody else's stuff is buying somebody else's stuff because they think everything made in America has been invaded by the NSA. So don't, I told them to look in the mirror. They weren't very happy with me. <laughs> They're lobbying. The FBI director in public is lobbying for this new Feinstein and Burr bill which says that you must comply with a warrant. And that sounds like, well, that's pretty benign, right? If you have probable cause and a judge writes a warrant, sure, you should comply. But you know what they mean by that one word, must? What they mean is that it's not a, you giving up information. They want to be able to tell Apple or any other company that you have to create something that doesn't exist. Apple purposely devised your phone so only you can get access to it. Apple has no secret code to get onto your phone. And yet, they want them to have to create something that doesn't exist. And they want special little back doors to get into your information, to get beyond encryption. And yet, if you open these back doors, who else uses them? Crooks, the people trying to steal your information, terrorists, foreign governments. What do you think happens to dissent in China if the Chinese government can get in everybody's phones? We have to look, frankly, at a different way. When I began my campaign, I said that we needed a bigger, better, bolder party. I told people, frankly, that the GOP brand, and I promised the chairman I would quit saying this, but I don't think he has any control over me anymore. Um, <laughs> the, GOP, the GOP brand sucks. And I don't say that to glorify in it. I say that because it's broken. You talk to kids on campus, they'll join a libertarian group. They'll join a liberty group. They don't want to be part of the Republican group. We have to make it cool again to be in a Republican group. We've got to make it acceptable for young people to want to be Republicans. <laughs> to be a bigger, better, bolder party, we've got to be a party that becomes more diverse. If we think we're gonna win by being the, the white man's party, we're not going to win that. I said that from the very beginning. We cannot win unless we have more Hispanics in our party, more Asians in our party, more African Americans in our party. So I began my campaign by going to Howard. I even went to Berkeley. I lived to tell about it. 
I went to Ferguson, I went to the south side of Chicago, not changing the message, but saying, look, we are the, mess we are the messengers of, and we are the party of civil rights. We are the party of equal protection under the law. We are the party of emancipation. Whatever happened, how do people forget about that? And all the libertarian things that we're for, the idea that you cannot be detained without a trial, who do you think that's protecting? That's protecting minorities. We are the defender of minority rights. We have every reason we could expand our party and go above and beyond where we've ever been. But we can't be the party that characterizes everybody that wants to immigrate to the United States as being a drug dealer or a rapist. People come to our country, and I'm not for no rules. I am for rules at the border. You gotta have rules. I'm not for open borders. But I also see most people who are dying to get to our country wanna come here for freedom and prosperity. And we have to understand that. And it isn't about policy. I guarantee if I was talking to a, a thousand uh, Latinos, a thousand Hispanics, and I told them, look, I'm for rules at the border, but I think people want to come here because it's a great country, and I don't look down upon you because you want to come to our country. You know what? I think many of them are open to that message. It isn't even about the policy. It's about the attitude. If people think you don't like them, they're not going to like you back. They're not going to be one part of your party if they think you don't like them. That's our problem. We are seen as the party that doesn't appear to be receptive to new people, doesn't appear to care about people who live in poverty. Three out of four people in prison are black or brown for nonviolent drug use. And yet, if you look at surveys, white kids are using drugs just as much. And you say, well, why is that, why is that happening? Are the police all racist? No, it isn't that. That's a dumb, stupid leftist argument to say it's the police's fault. But what is happening is the police just don't go to the suburbs. There's not much crime out there. So white kids get away with stuff, black kids don't. There is more crime in the city. Where do the police go? Where the crime is. But day after day after day, it adds up. And to our prisons are full of black people and brown people. If we can be the party that says we gotta change that, we gotta fix that, putting people in jail for 15 years for marijuana is ridiculous. We still have thousands of people, and this is one thing that President Obama did that was good. He let some of the people out that have been in jail for crack cocaine for 15 years. White kids were using powder cocaine and getting six months or probation or no time at all. And the black kids were getting 15 years. Some of them were still in jail. Remember, uh, what's the receiver for the Broncos? Demarius uh, Thomas? Is that right? I don't see any football fans. Nobody nodding their head. Demarius <laughs> Thomas? Everybody else asleep? His mom was commuted at sentence, but she was in for two 15-year consecutive sentences for drugs. None of this is to say that drugs are good, but you know what? If we were the party that said, you know what? People should get a second chance. Look, Christianity talks about redemption, talks about second chances. Uh, raise your hand if you never did anything wrong when you were in high school or college. <laughs> All right, two or, three, two or three liars here. All right. <clears throat> but the thing is, maybe there are, but a lot of people did mistake, make mistakes. Last three presidents, I think, admitted to making mistakes when they were younger. But they got a chance, they got lucky, and they, or they didn't get caught. So I think if we became a party that was more about having understanding where people come from, understand that there's a cycle from jail to drugs to poverty, trying to figure a way out of it. I've introduced a plan called Economic Freedom Zones, and I talk about a lot about this in the book. Economic Freedom Zones is the idea, and Jack Kemp talked about this some, um, the idea of lowering taxes dramatically in areas of poverty. Instead of saying, hey, let's send our money to Washington, and then we'll beg to get some back in the form of a grant, let's just never take it to begin with. It could be the equivalent amount of money, let's say it's a million dollars, but it's gotta be a thousand times more effective to leave it and not bring it back. Because if I bring you a million dollars back, who do I give it to? I don't know who's good in business. Who do politicians usually give it to? Their friends, their political contributors, cronies, buddies. Maybe it shouldn't be the politician deciding. If I give it back to you in the form of lowering your taxes, what happens? Who gets more of it? Those who are working harder and producing more and paying more in taxes. You could do these targeted tax breaks in areas of poverty. I'd do it for 10 years. But then it would show that, look, we have a policy consistent with being for less taxes, but we have a policy now for what we would do for people in poverty. Let's don't lock everybody up. Let's try to leave more money in their community. Let's try to stimulate growth in the areas that have had poverty. In my state, Appalachia has had poverty for 40 years. South side of Chicago has been struggling probably as long. We could fix some of these problems. We could also maybe win some elections by showing that we're not just the party of wealthy. We're not just the party of the white folk. So I think there's a lot we can do. The book's about a bigger, better, bolder future for us. 
And I appreciate very much you coming out today, and I hope you'll be part of that movement. Thank you very much. <laughs>